Hello, my name is Jonathan Leonard and this is the first of three introductory videos on the brain's main operating rules. These three introductory videos do not cover specifically any specialized subjects such as sleep, emotions, memory, consciousness, or dreams. However, if you would like to know how the brain accomplishes any of these tasks, and you don't yet know the brain's main operating rules, you would be well advised to view these first three videos, which provide a brief Cook's tour, before moving on to any of the other subjects. Certain basic facts determine how the brain works. So I will delve into such facts, about brain impulse speed and other interesting things, about how the brain processes information, the brain's power, its data holding capacity, its regional arrangements, and the critical coordinating structures toward its center that play a major role in lots of brain activities. A good way of starting this tour is to consider the speed of brain impulses. This is something that one would expect to be taught in any high school biology course, but generally isn't. For instance, as someone who has probably taken a high school biology course, do you know how fast the average brain impulse travels? It doesn't travel at 186,000 miles a second, the speed of light, this being roughly the speed at which electrical impulses whip around inside computers. It doesn't even travel at 7 miles a second, an appropriate speed for a space vehicle orbiting the Earth. Instead, it travels about 50 miles an hour, a speed typical of an ordinary car on a back road. This speed is still impressive if we recognize that our impulse is a chemical impulse rather than an electrical one, but so far as brains and computers go, it creates a real tortoise and hare situation. It hardly need be said that this slow message speed has serious implications for the human brain. To begin with, we can assume that this slow message speed has placed enormous evolutionary pressure on producing a brain that is tightly coordinated and compact. Such an evolutionary push toward tight coordination and compactness would help to explain a lot about the brain. To begin with, it would help to explain the brain's deep surface folds and its rounded shape, because these features tend to reduce the distance that brain impulses need to travel. Specifically, these features may reduce the distance that brain impulses need to travel in making short trips, and they very clearly cut the time needed to make long trips across the brain or between the brain's surface and the coordinators near its center. Slow message speed also helps to explain why the brain stores lots of detailed information on its deeply folded outer skin while providing central coordination of general functions like memory recall and consciousness in or near the center. That's because this tends to maximize the information that the brain can hold on its outer skin while cutting the time needed to go back and forth from the outer skin to the center. Beyond that, this slow message speed tells us how the brain must process information. Computers can process many bits of information one thing at a time, because this processing is done at roughly the speed of light. But the brain cannot, because the message speed is slow. It simply does not have the luxury of processing things one at a time, while its owner is preparing for a difficult exam, heading for a cliff, or avoiding an 18-wheeler. Instead, it must process most incoming information that needs processing all at once, which is what it does. This so-called parallel processing sounds a little like voodoo magic, but it gets a lot less mysterious when we realize that parallel processing is common outside the brain. In fact, parallel processing is the dominant means of communication within human society. We, of course, pass along a certain amount of information person to person by word of mouth, but we transmit much more by television, radio, the internet, newspapers, newsletters, announcements, and public meetings. Try to imagine our world without such parallel processing and things get really strange. For instance, 
Suppose the World Trade Center attack of September 2001 had been witnessed by only one person. And suppose that person took one minute to find and inform the next, and that person took one minute to inform the next, and so on. And finally, suppose the United States then had a population of 300 million people, and that this population remained the same, no births or deaths. In that case, everyone in the country would be informed of the World Trade Center attack in 571 years, and as of this video's making in 2013, we would have completed less than 2% of the reporting process. As this demonstrates, where messages travel slowly, not only in the human brain, but also in human society, parallel processing makes sense. But parallel processing requires careful setting up and distribution. As anyone knows who has worked for a newspaper, a fair share of the paper's time goes into assigning, screening, selecting, and placing stories. And beyond newspapers, this same principle of advanced selection, prioritizing, and placement of stories applies in some degree to nearly all of the mass media. To this, add prearranged distribution, for it's useless to have giant presses spin out two or three million copies of the New York Times unless the paper gets distributed. And while new readers are invited at newsstands and such, most copies go to specific subscribers, people who have said in advance that they want the paper and are willing to pay for it. The human brain is a past master at screening, prioritizing, placing, and distributing to a point where we take much of this prearranged parallel processing for granted. Consider touch, for instance. We assume that all but the softest touches will get felt, but that those with little news value, such as the touch of your chair seat or a steady unchanging touch, will be assigned low priority while touches signaling danger, such as the touch of a red-hot poker, will make headlines, and other sorts of touches, such as romantic caresses, will get put in special sections that arouse other sorts of attention. The brain has helpers in the nervous system, such as special pain receptors in the skin, that assist this process. Even so, we can clearly see that the brain has made advance arrangements for handling a vast horde of incoming sensory and touch and so forth data simultaneously, and that as a result, each sort of incoming information in the day's rush of incoming data will get more or less automatically screened and guided into the right channels. The bulk of this advanced setting up and distribution is based not only on the brain's genetic inheritance, but on its extensive and frequently repeated life experiences. And since many of these experiences, pyramided progressively one atop another, take a good while to happen, it's easy to see why we don't find full-fledged parallel processing computers that work like the human brain, and it is also easy to see why we humans, with our highly developed parallel processing brains, take such a long time growing up. This brings me to the end of what I want to say about the speed of brain impulses and the basic method used by the brain to process information. But there are myriad interesting things about the brain set forth in other brain channel videos. So for those of you who feel inclined to pursue this fascinating subject further, I invite you to continue onward.